Greetings, Zimbabwe, Africa, and the world. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Titan Law. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today, I'm in conversation with Toronto-based pediatric cardiologist, Dr. Norman Musewe. <music> Dr. Norman Msewe, welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you. Good to have you here. You are a world-class pediatric uh, uh, cardiologist uh, based in, uh, in Toronto, uh, Canada, Zimbabwean-born. You were born in, in Highfields uh, at uh, the Highfield Polyclinic. Uh, how, how, what has it taken to get to where you are right now? Um. I suppose it would be good to start with the beginning. Right. In the beginning was my mother and my father. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, we, um, uh, I was born in Highfields because we were living in old Highfields, right across from the clinic actually. And uh, I grew up in Highfields, the first of a family of seven. Uh, two girls and five boys, myself included. And I uh, used to walk to Chipembele School every day. My mother taught me my first grade, my very first grade, wow. sub A, wow. used to call it. Yeah. Wow. And I was actually left out of the group because when she picked her students, I was, I was not quite six. <laughs> I wasn't able to touch my ear in <laughs> that old story. <laughs> So when her, there, was, uh, there was a few short to fill her class, so they asked, who do you want to add to your class? That was the obvious choice. This, to say this, that I used to go to school, and sometimes my mother would give me a ride on her bicycle, back and forth, and she was a hard taskmaster. Mm. I had no excuse that I didn't do my homework, mm. you know, because... Uh, so I learned early, I learned the early values from her, and one of the things that she, she had the ear of the other teachers. So even as I went into grade one, grade two, and grade three, I, there was no way I could say things <laughs> <laughs> that she didn't know about. She, right. knew, she knew more about it than I did. And, and I think that kept the boundaries tight for me, for which I'm grateful. But also the teachers, well, some of my teachers were just amazing, encouraging. I remember Mr. Mkome in particular. Um, and, and there were there were two of us competing for first place, and this young man and myself, and I never beat him. I, I was always <laughs> second. But you know, that kind of encouragement from mm. from mom, from uh, the teachers, uh, and the desire to do well, because my mother, the one thing that I never forget that she told me, she told me about the story of Washington. Uh, and, and here's how it goes. He was... He was um, an African-American looking for a place in a college and they put him in a room after the interview and asked him to clean the room, just dust the room and went next door. And when they came back, they went to the obscure places to look, to make sure that he had dusted even the tops of the uh, cupboards mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. on. And they could not find a speck of dust. And my mother said to me, this is an abject lesson in your life. Whatever you put your hands to doing, put everything into it. Wow. It doesn't matter how small the task is or how big it is. So that's been a... Uh, and a your pillar. dad? And your dad? My dad, I am. Came to my dad because, you know, our early experience is always our mother. Of course. It? Yes, of our course. mother's a very powerful influence. So my father um, also taught us a teacher. And he was a principled teacher. He was a loving father. And the one thing I remember about him was how sacrificial mm. he was. His goal was to educate us to the last penny that he had, to, to the extent that he denied himself things in life. I know that. Uh, and I'll come to that later, how mm. that impacted me. Mm. Uh, so I, I, I was grateful because I saw the sacrifice that my father 
uh, did. I saw him walk back and forth to school when he could have bought a, a car. He didn't mm -hmm. buy a car. Mm -hmm. And um, what I do remember especially as well from, from him is that we would be walking. Uh, he was a carpenter. He used to teach carpentry. We, we used to be walking. We'd be walking to his uh, office, and he'd say to me, my son, do you see up there? What do you see up there? I'd say, the mm. sky. The sky mm. is blue. And he said, the sky is the limit. Oh, wow. The sky is the limit. You know, I, I can't explain how inspiring that is when you hear it from your own father. Wow. Yeah. And those values stayed with you. Yes. So you, you are, you're practicing now in, in, in Toronto. Toronto. What has the journey been like to, from moving from Highfields to finding yourself in Toronto. Okay. Describe brief briefly for us that journey. Okay. Um, after I, uh, uh, in, in Standard 5, I went to Bernard Mizeki Primary School, where I did Standard 5 and Standard 6. And then after that, I went to Bernard Mizeki College, which is just up the road, for Form 1 and Form 2. Uh, for s in, I, by the wisdom of my parents, they moved me to Goromonzi. Mm -hmm. And I can um, elaborate on that if you wish. But um, Gormons, I did my form three, four, five, and six. Uh, I then went to the University of uh, Zimbabwe, then University of Rhodesia in 1970, and graduated in 1975. I uh, actually had an, a, a sort of what they call an intercalated year. I broke my training for a year to go to Birmingham University. Um, to do a Bachelor of Science Because the Physiology. University of Rhodesia then was a college of Birmingham University, University wasn't it? Yes. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And they took the, first, the top two or three students and then gave us, uh, I did Physiology. And you happened to be one of the top two. I was. <laughs> 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 That's how I got the scholarship to go there for a year, yeah. which uh, taught me a lot, a lot and exposed me to, to, to new things and actually gave me a, a, a new desire, a new mm. passion to to having seen what I saw, I did research uh, there in physiology for a year, came back and finished my, uh, my, my degree, and then worked at Impilla for two years. Now, I think that's where the, my, my passion for pediatrics started, because there was a gentleman called Dr. Uh, Glyn Jones. Uh, I consider him a, an amazing pediatrician. He's, I watched him work with children. I, I, I learned so much from him. And I said, I want to be like that. Mm. I want to be like that. He is, is, is he one of your role models? He is. He would be. He would yes, be he would be. Unknowingly, uh, I don't think he even knew that, uh, you know, that he was influencing me that much. Mm. And I think that's, that's the characteristic of good role models. Mm. They don't know what they're doing. No. Yeah. They're, they're living be, their lives. Yes. They're just living their lives. <laughs> he was just excellent. And after two years at, uh, at Mpilo, I was committed to pediatrics for the rest of my life. There was no question about it. Uh, I don't know how, quite why, but I think he played a central role. Um, and then I moved to England. Uh, that's a whole story. Well, uh, the, the, I think it's an important story mm -hmm. because you didn't voluntarily leave no. uh, to, to go for England. You were forced by circumstances. Yes. Could you describe for, for, to us what, what, what forced happened? you to leave the country? Yeah. I, uh, in my second year of pediatrics, which was 1977, at Impilo Hospital. In October, I received uh, from the Ministry of Defense call-up papers to go and work uh, for, the, for the Ministry of Defense as a doctor. To work for the Army, basically. For the Army, basically, yes. at some, mm -hmm. in some shape, form, or other. I, uh, there were a few of us who were called up. One of my friends uh, went, went to Mozambique. I, I went to Botswana. I, I simply had to, quit, had to go. I couldn't conscience countenance myself uh, working for the then uh, uh, regime that was uh, in power. Uh, so they put me in an impossible position. So I quickly gathered everything together, sent it home to Highfields to my parents and said bye-bye. It had major implications because I was uh, accosted by the, by, the, by the army when I was crossing the border and they asked me where I was going. I, I made up a story and to my surprise, they believed they it. They believed your story? Yeah, they believed my story. Uh, and I went back, to, I went to Botswana Habaron, and then I had taken the precaution of uh, applying for a course in Scotland, uh, a, a postgraduate course. And that uh, led me into, uh, well, I went to jo Johannesburg and flew to London. On the 1st of January 1978, I was in the air, and I said, 
pray. Hallelujah. I was so happy because I was so terrified of the possible consequences. And that's what started my journey in England. Mm. Um, and and um, can I go on? The, m the most important thing there for me is mm -hmm. you, are first to you are forced to make a choice. Yes. A choice which has impacted on you um, almost for a lifetime, mm -hmm. which speaks to uh, purpose, mm -hmm. which speaks to who orders your steps, who gets you to yes. where you want to go. Do you want to talk to us about that? Absolutely. As I was on, the, on, the, on a journey to Botswana, I started thinking through life. There, there are moments like that when you're, you're in a crisis. And uh, I, I, I had the sense of guilt that I was, because the first born in the family, I was uh, almost abandoning, abandoning my family. I uh, labored with, with these thoughts quite a bit. And I, I suppose somewhere something started, started happening in me that started saying why and, and how. And of course, much later on, I realized that just in the same way Joseph was uh, sent in slavery to Egypt, God had a purpose. I didn't realize it then. Mm. Yeah. You didn't make the choice. Yeah. It was made for you. Yes. Okay. So you have left home, but you still remain connected to the place where you're born, which is uh, the Highfield Polyclinic. You almost come here almost every year to lend them support. Could you explain to us what, what has motivated that? Point number one. Point number two, what's the nature of the support that you're giving to the Highfield Polyclinic? Mm. Good. Um, <clears throat> Perhaps I could start by saying that this uh, dislocation from my birthplace, unwilling dislocation, took me on a journey which I'd like to describe in three dimensions. Sure. Actually. And I'd say that the, the first dimension uh, was the, the backward look, and, 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 and the second is the forward look. Mm. And there's a tension between those two, which is, I think is a, is, a, is a tension in everybody who goes into the diaspora. And it's, it's, a, it's a good tension. But it must be modulated by your worldview. Mm. And, and that's where the third dimension comes in, the, the looking up. And it was over time, as I felt this tension between the backward look, what is it like back home, and the forward look, why am I here? What am I going to do here? That led me, in some sense, to start reflecting inwardly and, 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 and looking upward and saying, you know, there must be a purpose to all this, because the diaspora experience is not is not the bed of roses as as, as we know. Um, and I think it's through that progression that the upward dimension, the looking to my Creator, and seeing His purpose in my life, that then ended up into reflecting inwardly to say, what then is my purpose? Is it enough just to be a cardiologist in Toronto and treat patients there? Is it enough to, to just raise my family? Mm -hmm. Is it enough to just work within my congregation? What's my circle of influence? And that backward tug, uh, is, is, it was a very powerful tug, mm -hmm. not only because I have relatives and friends here and, and parents, mm -hmm. but also... I, I, I want to, I want to mm -hmm. the, 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 don't hold that thought right there. Mm -hmm. But am I right that what you're describe, describing is search for purpose, search for meaning, Yes. Why am I here? Yes. 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 And it's a powerful question because I think every living human being asks that question. Yeah. yeah. At some point or other. And of course, there were obstructions, obstacles, where the grind of just being uh, in the diaspora, the, 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 the blocks, the walls that you have to you know, uh, go over, the challenges, just sometimes just push you down mm. so much. But you lose that. Uh, I, I, want to, I want to focus on something important that you're raising, mm -hmm. the grind of being in the diaspora. Yeah. Please unpack that for us. What does that mean? It means a few things. I think uh, the first, it means just making a livelihood. There are lots of us who get out there and you find out your qualifications are not what you thought they were. Mm -hmm. And then you have to sit a whole lot of exams. And 
the, uh, so there, there are many requirements, and that alone, I mean, I had to rewrite my medical exam when I went uh, to Canada, the actual great qualifying exam. And then on top of that, it's the um, uh, getting into the system, getting a, making headway. There are obstacles, in particular in England. Some of them, sad to say, are just simply racial. And, and those are the most tough ones because you know you can do it, but you're denied the opportunity. Mm. Yeah. And, and uh, even at one stage, I, I couldn't find jobs in England, and I had to do manual work to make sure that I could make a little bit of money. But here you are, yes. successful. Yes. Rendering help to the place that uh, uh, witnessed you, witnessed you coming into into this world. Yes. Describe that uh, that uh, connection, that umbilical connection between you and that place in Highfield. In Highfield, because of that that desire to to be meaningful, to make a meaningful change, and because I saw children in Toronto getting excellent care. I asked, started asking myself the question, what about in Highfield? Mm. What about where I was born? What's going wow. on there? Wow. What's going on there? And so I made a few trips just to, to look. And one of my first trips when I went to, came to Highfield, I went to the Poly Clinic. And the remarkable thing was that the bed on which I was born, 65 or 60 years, I was about 10 years ago, ago was still the same bed in there, in the same ward. And I said to myself, this cannot be. Uh, something has to be done, something has to change. So at that time, with the uh, as assistance of the then mayor, uh, Mr. Masunda in Harare, uh, we concocted an issue. I said, you know, what can we do? And he said, look, primary care is being provided at the polyclinic level. Perhaps you should focus your efforts there. And I said, fine. At that time, actually, we were running a small company in South Africa, so we bought equipment, uh, hard, hard equipment, uh, incubators and so on for the resuscitation of newborn babies and it's still there in, uh, in, in, the, in the hospital. And then I uh, have an affiliation with an organization called Health Partners International, International mm -hmm. which is based in Canada. And what they do is they collect medications from pharmaceutical companies and become the portal mm -hmm. uh, to provide for us. And, and so th that affiliation allowed us to ship or bring mm -hmm. medications periodically to the clinic, in addition to other things at all, as all the things that they asked for, blood pressure machines, glucometers, even pens and pencils, and pens, uh, pens and paper. So that's, that's what we've been doing. Great stuff. Talk to me about your, your, your you, you talk about your, um, your looking upwards and looking yes. internally. Yes. Uh, wh where, had, where has that looking uh, ended up in terms of uh, where, have, where have you arrived at? Yes. Um, one of the amazing things for me, for me, is that God would love each human being so passionately that it's unreal. It's nothing like anything on earth. And when I recognized that, that God, I'm not just a, a number, I'm not just an, an, a random individual. God thought about me before I was even born, appointed me to be born at the Highfield Polyclinic on the 6th of April, 1950. No accident, everything planned. Uh, and then I discovered Jesus Christ. God in man dying on the cross. And, and I said to myself, if God loves me so much, so much, that he would send his son just for me alone, mm -hmm. even for me, Mm. It just blew all my circuits. It made me, it melted me inside, mm. which then God started remolding me, remolding me into a new creation, as, as we know. And that, that new creation that I have become tells me that one of the uh, scriptures that I like says, the love of Christ compels us. You cannot just sit back. You're asking the question, yes, I am my brother's keeper. What ought I to do? Mm. So that's where it's led me, where I belong to a, uh, a, a vibrant congregation in Toronto called the People's Church. We are very, very involved in those areas where I believe God's heart is. The, uh, the oppressed, the poor, the aliens, the widows, the orphans. That's where my heart is. Mm -hmm. And uh, reading around you, uh, I realized, like you're saying, that justice and human dignity 
are things that are very important to, to you, perhaps part of your, 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 your purpose. And, 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 and that, that passion obviously comes from the, the journey that you've walked um, with, with your creator outside, outside, outside medicine. Mm -hmm. You've ended up being appointed chairman of the board of uh, International Association of Refugees in, uh, in Canada. Talk to us about that pro project and, and, and what, you, what you're involved in. Mm -hmm. I think the UNHCR, United Nations uh, High Commission for Refugees, puts out data that says, I, if I'm not wrong here, about 60 million people on earth are migrate, migrant. They are moving either internally or externally, crossing borders or looking for sanctuary outside of uh, far from where they were born for all sorts of reasons. And um, number one. Number two, living in Toronto, we receive at least a quarter of a million refugees every year. Hmm. Number three, I also recognize that I was a refugee at one time because I, as I migrated, I saw other people migrating, perhaps using different paths, mm -hmm. but going through the same experience. As a consequence, um, we said in, in our congregation, the, the, we, have to, we, have to, we have to help. These are people who are ordinarily find doors closed. They are rejected. They, they get the worst. They're at the bottom of the pile, if you like. And, and so we, uh, I personally and with the church work in refugee homes that are in Toronto where we, see, we, we receive refugees from all over the world. And I must say 50% of them are from Africa. Mm. And so we get interaction. It's amazing when they see another African who sees himself in the diaspora, who says, you know, I know what it's like to have traversed borders uh, unwillingly for whatever reason. And have a duty to give back. And have a duty to do something to mm. comfort you. Because while the government can provide, uh, uh, they do provide social welfare, social assistance, mm. they get health care and so on, there's a gap. And the gap often is that, is that emotional, spiritual, traumatic experience that needs to be answered by walking with somebody, by loving somebody, by mm. befriending them. Mm. And, and letting them speak out and share their experience. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and yet it's not all um, who are welcoming of refugees. Yes. We've seen, you are in Canada, we've seen America next door yeah. uh, closing the doors to, uh, to, to, to refugees. Have you seen an influx of refugees coming to Toronto where you are because they, they can't be welcomed uh, in, in America? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We've had people cross the border at all sorts of places and some actually have suffered frostbite and lost their limbs walking through the, the, you know, the ice and the snow just to get across the border in Canada. Because in Canada, every single person that claims refugee status has to have a hearing. Mm -hmm. There's a protocol. They, they, don't, they don't lock you up or send you away. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. what your history mm -hmm. is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the one thing, is, again, as I was reading, is your involvement with uh, I Live Again, Uganda, Uganda yes. Ali. Um, which is an organized, talk to me about Ali, yeah. uh, what they do and how you got to, involve, to, to get to be involved with them. Yes. In the congregation where I go, we have a, a amazing leadership and, and we are constantly looking out to see uh, what can we do to affiliate ourselves with people uh, who not only we can help, but who also can help us, because we recognize that we have problems also in Canada that need. We have the First Nations issue that hasn't been resolved. We have racial issues. We have tra tra traumatized people, and they need healing. This particular organization called I Live Again Uganda, started by a good friend of mine, Benson Ochen, um, as a model, which is amazing. Their model is take people who are traumatized, do trauma counseling, disciple them, and then they go through, through that discipling and that trauma counseling and so on, they become uh, redeemed. It's a, it's a process of redemption. Their hearts are, are changed and then they are restored, restoration. So it's a whole cycle that makes the human being who was traumatized and beaten down feel whole again. That's why it's I live again, Uganda. It particularly applies in Uganda, particularly to internally displaced people from the north who are living in slums in Kampala. And that's where we learned many lessons. When we weren't there, we saw the work, we saw how God was working in the very slums. 
the, the pastors and, and, and the church working with very little resources uh, in, in those traumatized circles, we realized that we had to walk along mm. with them, mm. walk along, alongside mm. them. So now we're in refugee camps as well, where we go to refugee camps and empower those who are uh, filling that gap. In fact, one of the interesting things is that we have been very welcomed by the United Nations, by all other agencies, because they are saying, we can provide the food and the mm. shelter and so on, but these people are still traumatized and mm. hurt. And when they leave here, they're still traumatized and hurt. These are, these are people traumatized and hurt mm -hmm. by the um, uh, 20 years of conflict in northern yeah. Uganda mm -hmm. because of the so-called Lord Resistance, Resistance Army. Army. Yeah. And what I found interesting is that these people uh, are traumatized. They get counseling. They get discipleship and then they get recycled. But what, what I found interesting, which, which, which I think uh, connects to the journey that you've walked and, and connects to a lot of things that Zimbabweans are going through right now, mm -hmm. where people, these Ugandans are asking, why did God allow this to happen to me? Mm -hmm. Why did I suffer so much? Yes. And some of them even ask, why did God allow me to survive? Yes, yes, yes. Deep questions. Deep questions. Deep, deep questions. Especially when you've lost people close to you and you're the only one that has survived. Uh, am I worth more than those people that did not survive? It, it raises such deep questions. And unless those questions are engaged in a deep, deep way through a, comp a, 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 a discipleship, and actually their, their model is amazing. They do group counseling, mm -hmm. not individual counseling, mm -hmm. because they believe that by telling your story to others, you identify with others mm -hmm. and you feel less lonely. Mm -hmm. I'm not the only one mm -hmm. that's gone through this. And that's part of the healing process, mm -hmm. healing journey. Yes. This is an amazing example. Um, and I'm looking at you, the time you've spent in the diaspora, your knowledge and experience in Africa, you being a, a, a scientist. When you're looking at this example coming from Uganda, do you think there are certain lessons that Africa can offer to the West? Absolutely. In fact, I think it is in the, in the very crucible of suffering that God works the most. And, 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 and this is uh, uh, the deception in the West now is, is that everything is okay. We've, we've got all our needs, our daily needs are provided, and they're not provided by God. They're provided by because we work hard, we are smart, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And, uh, and yet, they're still deeply traumati traumatized. I mean, the rate of divorce there, the kids that are on the streets, the alcohol and, and drug uh, Suicide. abuse, suicides, and so on, it's a mess. And I see those children in my, in, my, in my context, in my office, kids who are suffering from anxiety and depression. They're only teenagers. They're only starting to live their lives. So the, the amazing thing I have learned that God has taught me is this, that. When you need solutions, go to where it's least expected you'll find the solutions. Mm. And we found the solutions in the slums where the poorest of the poor are living. And you learn abject lessons from them that reorient you, even change your worldview, mm. and, and make you realize that the, the, the heroes of the world are not up on pedestals, you know, uh, traveling the world in, in jets and so on. They're not. They're the common people. It's the common people. Mm. Can I say something about sure, that, if absolutely. I may? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, one of the things that people often ask is, who is your hero? Who are, who are the people that you look up to? Yeah. And I think that's a very important issue to, to talk about. I think there is no single hero. I think the heroism is a collective, mm. yes. And, and so when we put one individual on, on the pedestal, I think we, we don't do justice to, to what heroism means. And I, I have found heroes in this country. In the two weeks that I've been here, I've seen the little children walking to school in bare feet. I've seen the mothers carrying their babies on their backs and selling tomatoes. I've, uh, last night, just last night, I went to Magaba. I went inside this room, inside the room. I went with this, this lady, I won't mention, but she, she's an amazing woman. She said, come to my home. And I went in there and I, I saw and I smelled and I felt. And, and I looked at this woman's character and I said, this is where the heroes of the world are. Mm -hmm. And we have to pay attention to that. We are not going to le learn our lessons from, from you know, 
echelons of uh, society. Yes. With your love for, for, ch for children, um, it, it must be heartbreaking walking around Barry, like you're saying, mm -hmm. Magaba mm -hmm. and so forth, mm -hmm. and seeing the destitution yeah. Yeah. And, and the suffering that the kids are going through, um, uh, not being able to go to school and, 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 and so forth. What does that do to your heartstrings? Just as you say, Trevor, it pulls at your heart so much, you want to cry. And, and uh, <laughs> I think mm. that we're not it for God's purposes in my life. I would be one of those kids, mm. Trevor. Mm. And that just breaks my heart. So uh, I, I ask the question, why me, God? Why was I spared? walking in, 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 in this, in, I mean, garbage and swamps and, 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 and dirt and why? But I know God has a purpose. Mm. And so I ask God, what should I do? And it's quite clear, uh, quite clear that he, he sends, he equips, he enables, but the burden never actually goes away because that's what propels you. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Wow. Um, Moving to a space where I've, I've having lived in the diaspora myself, mm -hmm. I've been amazed by the them and us mm -hmm. attitude. Those at home think that those in the diaspora um, don't know enough about what's happening. Those in the diaspora think that those at home don't know, you know. Um, need to be helped. Mm. What's your sense of that them and us, given where you, where, where you sit? I would say that it's, it's, it's a false dichotomy. And as, as, as the world is not binary. Mm. It's not this, uh, you know, the left or the right. It's a continuum. Mm. And in that continuum, a lot of people are caught um, uh, and, and, and some people fall through the cracks, but some people end up seeing that there's a purpose for them being, as I said, you know, being, being in, 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 in England or in, in Europe or whatever. Um, I think that it's your heart that matters. I think that in addition to the fact that most people that are out there in, Af in, in, in the diaspora, most of us Africans, still have family out here. I mean, we are aware of the fact that a lot of uh, African countries are supported even fiscally by money that's sent from the diaspora, by people who are working very hard. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, people who are living in small apartments, three or four or five people. That's one thing they were saying in Europe. They were saying, we don't understand. Why six of you want to live in one, one little room mm -hmm. when you can afford? Because all the money is coming back. So, so there's a way in which the dichotomy has been created, s sadly, and I don't know who benefits from that dichotomy? Mm. Because people are working hard to support uh, their families here, and uh, and I know there are people like me who are also sending equipment, sending, and they're saying, "What can I do?" Mm. So, I don't think that's ever the case. Uh, I think we are different Africans uniquely. I mean, when I go to America or to Canada, Irish Canadians don't think about Ireland. They have left Ireland; it's mm. behind. Mm. But for us Africans, it's just different. Mm. And I believe that's one thing we can teach the world. We stay connected to where we come from. Yes. Yeah. It's very important. We have extended family. It's not you as an individual. It's everybody else that's behind you. Moving to, um, to, to your profession, uh, medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm recommending this, this book to those that are at home, uh, Hacking Darwin by... Um, Jamie Mel Metz Met Metzl, if I can pronounce it. Uh, it's, it's a pretty frightening book in terms of what science is doing mm -hmm. to medicine. The uh, intersection between genetics, biotechnology, on one hand, artificial intelligence, and big data. And um, some would say, you know, to the extent that man is playing God, Mm. thinking that we can edit who we are mm. 
and what we, what we are. What's your view on that? In the world in which I work, which is pediatric cardiology, some of the there have been good advances that have come out as a consequence of biotechnology and, 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 and so forth. Interventions that are now assisting and helping children who would otherwise not live uh, good lives because of their cardiac disability. Um, so if I may mention some of those, sure. for example, you know, non-invasive intervention, which is a big thing now. You don't have to cut open the chest. Mm. Uh, implant implanting of valves in the heart, mm -hmm. uh, closing defects with uh, devices that you actually put through a vein, the femoral mm. vein in the heart. And not only that, intervening even in utero, in babies before they are born, who mm. may have critical valve mm. uh, pathology, that you can actually open that valve, and the data is still coming out that some of those things are making a difference. On the other end of the spectrum, we also have children who have had heart surgery, who are growing into adulthood, who have new problems that we haven't encountered before. So it's a learning experience mm. at both ends. The challenge is that because we gather, we can garner so much information even before a baby is uh, 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 born, uh, let alone born, mm. even as the baby is being formed, that there are abilities, you, you know, this technology, CRISPR, that technology yeah. of slicing mm. genes and the replacing genes. Um, and with the diagnostic uh, capabilities, genetic di di diagnostic capabilities increasing, I think the great risk is that anything that's imperfect, even in the slightest way, is going to be rejected. And that, that, that seeking for the perfect human being is, I think, the actual destruction mm -hmm. of the human being mm -hmm. as they are. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think that that's what our Creator intended. So the, the, the good things yes. from AI, yes. and there are things that are raising big question marks of, uh, you know, around ethics, around morality and so forth. Absolutely. Am I, am I right? You're absolutely right. Who, has go, who is going to be the gatekeeper? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, individual rights become more and more important. And therefore, there's no collective, there's no place where we can gather and say, is this right? Mm. Is this not right? If it's not right, if we don't... So somebody once said that the moral underpinnings of society are being taken down brick by brick. And as a consequence, it's each man for himself. Yeah. What is possible can be done, mm. and if you can afford it, do it. And there's no regulation. No regulation. Which is a frightening thing. Yes. And yet there's so much money that is being put into um, the health sector by... Google, by Amazon, by Apple, by Facebook, because of the opportunities that they see yes. outside regulation. Yes. Does that not worry you? Oh, of course. It's a big problem. And as I say, if there is no credible gatekeeper, mm. where are we going to go? And I mm. think we have already indications that uh, uh, the things that are happening, trying to create perfect human beings, some stuff has already been done that you are aware of. Yes, in China. In China, yeah. Um, it's... It's seriously dangerous mm. for us as a human race. You, you are an interesting scientist and doctor. A man of faith, as we've seen just now, a passionate man. And, and yet a lot of scientists tend to mock those that uh, uh, believe that there is a, a higher being, that there is God that we were created and that it wasn't an explosion that resulted mm. in us. How, how do you explain that balance for you as a, a scientist scientific. who fully embraces God? Mm. Mm. That's, a, that's actually, I think again, that's a creation of those who have a purpose to discredit God, to dethrone mm. God. It's, it's a false narrative because when you look at it, in my perspective anyhow, science itself is discovering what God has made. There is no single scientist who has created something themselves. And they're simply using God's material. And I think science is, a, is, is an amazing opportunity. And there are many. I must say that people like Blaise Pascal, Madame Curie, and John uh, Isaac Newton himself, the three laws of motion, they were passionate believers. And even today, people like John Lennox, uh, and, and the foremost, as, foremost astrophysicist is the protagonist of the fact that there is a creator and there was a beginning, mm. a purposeful beginning. Um, you, 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 pretty a busy man. 
but you are you are a pianist. Do you still play the piano at all? Yes, I do, <laughs> and um, fortunately, also my my daughters, and my children also have played, and I'm intending to teach my uh, grandchildren. Um, I must say this that I have heard, and I, I haven't actually read the research, but I'm told that when you use when you uh, play a musical instrument, it actually raises your um, intellectual capabilities by a significant amount. And that's why the Chinese have a piano in every home and in every house. Uh, so, uh, uh, because you have to memorize tracks and tracks of scores and, and, and its precision, its attention and so on. I, I think a lot of children with ADHD mm -hmm. could do with piano lessons mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. you, you, you played, you would do uh, cameo appearances with uh, the Sol Salisbury Philharmonic Orchestra. Talk to me about that. I actually played. Uh, I was a second violinist. I was, in, you know, in the in the. H it was actually the student orchestra at the College of Music, uh, not the Philharmonic. Yeah, but I did uh, take part in what they used to call the I Stanford competitions. Uh -huh. where I won second right. prize right. Um, uh, at the at Harry Margolis, Harry Margolis yes. Hall. Yes. It's still there. Yes, it's still there. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. I remember that. Yes, and uh, of course thereafter I uh, I. I played in, in church quite a bit. I was a pianist, in fact, at Goromonzi. There were only two of us who played on Sunday mornings. That was Mr. Hammond and myself. Mm. So I, uh, you know, that was... You, you, you've got these, these uh, uh, the, uh, the way you were raised mm. in, in Highfield, the values that you just outlined to us, mm. which clearly have uh, been hugely important in who you've become. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, talk to me about the importance of family and parenting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> um, I think there's, there's this thing called emulation. I think it's, it's example. I think example is, is, is a phenomenal thing. Because w as we learn as children, it's because we look and see and absorb. And I think the messages that we give children are critical, are very important. And there's an opportunity for timely messages which you implant in children's hearts. C.S. Lewis is a great, I love C.S. Lewis. Mm. He's a great proponent. He says you can smuggle things into children's hearts. <laughs> right. You know, he's written all these <laughs> stories and so on. You know? right. And there are great opportunities to do that, to smuggle good stuff into their hearts. And, and, and that then I mean, the scripture says, raise the children mm. uh, in, 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 the, in, these, in this way and it will not depart from mm. it. Yeah. So I think the early years, the first seven years, are critical, critical, critical. To be a good parent, I would say a God-fearing parent, one who knows that it's not just by so providing externals and, 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 and comforts. comforts and so on. And, and if you do that, you are leaving a great gap which will cause a lot of consequences in, in the future. Consequences. Mm. Mm. So, as far as I and my, uh, my family were concerned, our mom and dad took us to church every Sunday. I, in fact, I remember, one of the, uh, I did mention this, one of the most powerful things that I remember was I slept in a room, you know, our, our walls in Harare were paper, in Highfield were paper thin, you know, you could hear. <laughs> 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 and I remember every night my dad used to sing, um, uh, Abide With Me, Fast Falls, that, you know, the, uh, whatever, I can't remember. But that, I used to say, why is he singing that? He's saying that because he's looking to somebody else to take care of himself and us. So parenting, I think, uh, is the biggest challenge in our lives mm -hmm. and is a lot of work. And it requires uh, a, a commitment that must be, uh, that must be more than just what we know on earth. It must be supernatural. And, and you, you have, you know, talking about modeling and smuggling uh, things into, into our kids, your uh, daughter, um, Toilin, um, is now a, an exceptional ophthalmologist. Yes. Um, uh, talk to me about that. Yes, we have four children, mm -hmm. twin boys and two girls. She's the only one that's uh, become a doctor. And she asked me, Dad, what should I do? I said, well, what would you like to do? She graduated as a doctor. I said, you know, she said, you know, Dad, one of the things is sight. I think sight is very, very important mm -hmm. for people. And there are many people with trachoma and blindness in, in uh, tropical countries and so on. So 
That's why she did that. And actually, we have been on, on, on mission trips together to Ghana and, uh, and so on. And she actually wants to come here as well because to offer free treatment. Um, and I think it is because of what she saw as we grew up. We were involved in missions at an early age after I was uh, born again. Um, it was clear that uh, we had to work with others that are doing good work. Uh, so so she, you've, you, you've smuggled in the passion for missions to her, her and she, yes. that's amazing. And she's following. That's through. amazing. Yeah. Do you get time to read? What books have you read which have uh, impacted uh, positively in, in, in your life? Do you want to, to share that with our, Audience, our viewers? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. One uh, quick thing I may just say uh, sure. before I answer that question yeah. is that, uh, you know, I, the, the pediatric part of my life is still very, very active. And we work with uh, an organization called the Herbie Fund at, at, uh, oh. in, at uh, the uh, Sick Kids Hospital, Children, uh, Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto and they provide free cardiac surgery. So I'm very involved in that, and we have currently two children from here that are awaiting their Canadian visas to travel to Toronto. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we host them in our homes for the time that they're there. They get their surgery for free, and they fly back. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say that. That's, that's, an, that's an important project. What yeah. do people do, need to do to be able to be considered for their kids to be considered uh, for that project? They need to be connected to the pediatricians here. We have a particular, uh, we've been working with Dr. Bannerman and also Dr. Claudine Passy, mm -hmm. who uh, she's a pediatrician, he's a cardiologist, the only pediatric cardiologist in the country as far as I know. And so it's through him um, that we liaise with him and say, you know, bring children mm -hmm. that have this, mm -hmm. uh, that have heart disease. And we come in, I came last May to evaluate them to pick out appropriate candidates and then start the process. Mm -hmm. But it must be through the local... And this is going to be a long-term project, you, you Absolutely. reckon? Absolutely. It's okay. not the first time we've done it. Mm -hmm. it uh, we've done it for many years, yeah, Fantastic. for different African countries. So to go to your books. question that you mm -hmm. asked, books. Um, I am discovering, perhaps or rediscovering, African literature. So I uh, was saying to you the other day that I'm re reading Out of the... Uh, was it Out of the Darkness? Light yes, yes. By Bettina Gappa. And I saw her on this program, and I said, I must read that book. <laughs> I read the Tsitsi Dangarembwa, uh, Nervous Conditions, and I'm waiting to read uh, the two sequelae I hear that she's written mm -hmm. already. Um, I, uh, I also read uh, some of, the, I've, I've read Chinua Achebe, every single book that he's written, and his last book was uh, There Was a Country, mm -hmm. a powerful book, powerful book. I read Ngugi Wathiongo, Ngugi Wathiongo, The River Between, I just finished that. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm looking at the interaction between Western civilization and African culture. Mm. And, and those mm. books kind of talk about that. Petina Gaba's book yeah. talks yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's, the, of course, I read a lot of, uh, I have a rhythm. I have a, 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 a faith rhythm that I, I, I exercise every day, which means devotions, uh, reading the scriptures, uh, solitude, time of solitude and, and prayer. And that's my rhythm. Mm. And through that, I read a lot of books. And I, I have one that I'd like to, to give you. Right. May I? Please do. Yes, Please yes, do. yes, yes. Please yes. Do. Please I, do. Yeah, you, you may. Thank you. So Thank you. It's a commentary mm -hmm. on, on, on a portion of Jeremiah. But you see that it says here. Run with the horses, the, the quest, quest for life at its best. best. The quest for life at its best. Thank you very much for this book. I thank will uh, read and, and give you feedback. Yes. Um, Norman, thank you so much. I like what you've just said at the end there. That, that rhythm. What did you call it? Rhythm? The rhythm. The rhythm. The rhythm of life. Faith rhythm. Faith yeah. rhythm. I like that. Yeah, that's, that's where the energy comes from. Yeah. That's where the, the passion, that's where the direction comes from. Meditation. That's meditation. Spending time by yourself, uh, with yes, yourself. Absolutely. That's a must. Yes. Yeah. Norman, thank you so much for coming on to, on to the show. We... Uh, appreciate the work that you're doing, uh, uh, providing help to, to the Highfield uh, uh, Polyclinic, Polyclinic and uh, the work that you, uh, the, the assistance that you're giving to kids with uh, heart ailments. And we wish you all the very best uh, with, all those, uh, with all those projects. Thank you for coming. And to our viewers uh, uh, at home, we thank you for watching In Conversation with Trevor. We wish to remind you that uh, In Conversation with Trevor is a weekly show um, and we invite you to subscribe to the show. There is a, a subscribe button 
press to that uh, press on that subscribe button so that you receive uh, weekly notifications anytime uh, every time that we have a new uh, uh, program upload thank you so much for watching see you next time